Greetings, everybody. I'm going to go into our slideshow here. Josh Lane uh, calling in on our webinar today from the Hudson Valley, in New York State with eight shields here. And I'm really excited to get into this open house today about rebuilding nature connected communities. And this will be a deep dive, not only into the details about our nine month distance immersion that's coming up this September, uh, for those of you who are thinking about doing that, but also along the way, uh, we'll be sharing some of the, the principles, really the philosophy that underpins this program. Um, so you'll be sure to get some ideas from that as well that have proven helpful uh, in many communities around the world. And that'll help you get a better understanding of why we've put together this, pro <coughs> excuse me, this program and why we put the pieces in places we have. Um, so I just want to start off just by saying thanks to Matt for holding space for us here and for all of you who are tuning in today or who listen to the recording and just thinking about uh, the stories that we'll be sharing here today. I've had a lot of minds and hearts interlinked that have uh, been experimenting with this idea of how can we build connection uh, with the earth in this modern era with all the distractions we have going on today. Um, how can we effectively do that? And so many hands, many hearts, many minds have gone into this over the years. Uh, so just gratitude to all those who have played a role in that. And speaking of that, I wanted to invite John to say hello and see if you have any opening words for us here, because I know that really uh, so much of this work at Eight Shields has been really supported by your dedication and commitment. So thank you for being here today and, and welcome. Thank you, uh, Josh. Can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Yeah, I'm only here by voice at the moment, but um, yeah, it's uh, great to see people coming from all over the world. I, I love that. I'm just grateful for everybody's uh, interest and participation and in uh, the work of, of bringing people back in into balance and connection with themselves and nature and each other. And um, yeah, I'm really grateful for all the preparation, Josh, that you and Amy and the team at the uh, H. Shields Institute has put together with us and me and, and over these years to really create some um, continually improving systems to train people at all the different levels and layers of, uh, of community mentoring. So I'm really personally excited about, um, you know, what you're going to be talking about today, Josh, and, and really looking forward to participating um in uh the, the program starting this fall with everybody again as we have for the last several years and it's just been a wonderful opportunity to build networks of support and connection all over the world and it just keeps growing and yeah, there's just a lot of cool stuff going on and i second your gratitude for matt who is uh such an important uh member of our team and he, he really holds a lot together for us so thank you matt and thank you josh i'll give it back to you awesome well thanks for being here john and thanks for all your dedication to this over the years, really helping so many people uh, expand these connections in their communities. So for those who don't know me, my name's Josh Lane. Um, I've been working with Eight Shields really since before it was Eight Shields, uh, all the way back to 2004, uh, and serving as a mentor and uh, really bringing a lot of focus to our Shikari tracking uh, mentorship and bird language and also transformative mentoring, which underpins both of those processes. Um, but my own journey with this really began back when I was a teenager, back in, I guess, 1999, something like that, 98, 99, uh, going to a wilderness uh, workshop for a week where we were doing things like shelter building, living in a debris hut, making fire by friction, herbal studies, all that kind of stuff. But what really stuck with me from that week was not just the skills, although those were transformative in and of themselves, but there was something I couldn't quite put my finger on that surrounded that week because there were volunteers coming in. Uh, there were people helping out, role modeling these different skills, sharing stories, asking questions, um, and bringing a certain spirit to the event through their own curiosity and passion. And it all wove together and there was just a feeling in the air that whole week that really supercharged my experience. It really got me into the moment. It got me curious about that landscape, about the beings that live there. 
And it really, more than anything, got me asking a lot of questions that I'd never asked before. When I left that week, I was really buzzing. And it really, the impact of that lasted for months and really inspired me to go into a deep dive of naturalist skills right in my own backyard, learning the plants that were growing on the lawn and working on my fire by friction and tracking. And um, when I thought back to it, I thought, wow, you know, what was that? What made that so powerful, that experience? How was it that so much happened in such a short time? And it wasn't until a bit later that I found out that part of that magic is what we're going to be talking about today, and that's the ACORN model. And this is the underpinnings of rebuilding nature connected communities. This is what we're going to get into today. And just wanted to give that little backstory uh, because it's something that's really driven my whole nature journey since then. And if we look at the big picture um, of humanity on a long term scale over hundreds of thousands of years, what we see is a picture of this really beautiful interdependence between people and the planet. A cycle of nature and culture that feeds from one to the other, that promotes a sense of harmony um, and really a sustainable, regenerative type of, of living. And on the culture side of that, you could see practices such as just subsistence living, actually finding food on the landscape. And because people have been doing that, that automatically gets them attuned to the land. And that starts to feed into the culture. It comes into the songs, the dance, the art, the stories of that culture. And so all those things are reinforcing what's coming in through living closely with the land. And on the nature side of that, as they connect their senses, as they're attuning to the plants, the animals, the weather, and all these natural cycles, there's these really intimate species connections. People are getting to know the animals that live in their neighborhood like family. They're getting to know the plants and the qualities of the clays that they're making pottery with, the quality of, of the plants that they're weaving into baskets and clothing and fishing line. And they're developing this amazing knowledge of place that's based on relationship. So it's not just a mental knowledge of place of knowing what you can do, but it's a felt knowledge. It's one that's based on relationships. And you'll notice in this slide that I also have rites of passage there on this nature side. And you might think, well, why is that? You know, isn't a rite of passage something a culture does, you know, an initiation of sorts? And yes, that's true. But if you think about all the great rites of passage, so many of them involve sending people into nature to have an experience. So it relies on that space of nature to bring back something to the community. And if we don't create these rites of passage, co-create them with nature. Nature will give us rites of passage, whether we like it or not. Sometimes in the fear of, or in the, in the sense of uh, facing fear of cold and wet and dark and many other things. So we see this interdependent cycle. It's gone on for most of our existence as a species. And on the cultural side, there's wisdom that develops there through that applied uh, continual connection with place. That place-based culture develops a wisdom for how to live. And nature provides a wisdom of its own that infuses into that culture. You'll notice the two sides of the wheel here. The thing that keeps that going is mentoring. So as the culture develops wisdom, those ways get passed on across the generations. Now, this is where the need for this program comes in today. Because in this diagram here, we see that there's a gap where that place of mentoring was, that place that supported the transmission of that cultural wisdom and the wisdom of nature. There's a broken point there. And that's there for a lot of reasons. Displacement, war, trauma, all kinds of things have created this loss of wisdom of culture. And now what's driving our culture, right? Well, we have media, we have so many different distractions today. And we see a lack of that mentoring of knowledge of place. Now, there's good news, though. The good news is that the wisdom of nature is still there. It's waiting for us to tune back in. So this is where we get into this idea of how do we do that? How do we bring nature back into the dialogue of our culture? And so 
let's talk about culture for a minute. Every moment we're surrounded by culture. Anytime you get a group of people together, there's going to be this dynamic of culture. But just like the picture here with a magnet and all of these paper clips lining up through the paper clips, if you look at it, you can see there's lines of force, there's lines of tension. And you can only see them because the paper clips are there. If they weren't there, it would be invisible. But that magnet would still be exerting an influence. And culture is like this too. It's impacting us every day, everywhere we go, whether we realize it or not. Now, that impact, those lines of force are made up of things like attitudes that we hold. It's made up of the beliefs that we hold, consciously or unconsciously. And these translate into actions that reinforce the culture and the things that we focus our senses on. So if we were to deconstruct some of those lines of force of culture, that's what we would be seeing underneath in that invisible array. So the thing is, you know, you might say, well, that's all well and good. You know, it's like, but what can you do about it, right? You know, we're experiencing the effects of culture every day, but how much impact can we have on that? Well, one thing I like to say is that culture isn't just something that happens, although that does happen. You get a group of people together and something will emerge. Some kind of culture will emerge, whether it's unintentional or intentional. But the good news is we can also be intentional about it. Just like if you took a piece of sourdough um, starter, you know, you left it out to start it and it would catch some of that wild yeast that's in the air and it would start that dough, turn it into sourdough and get it to start to rise. You know, we can also jumpstart our own uh, microcultures, you could say, in our different team environments or community learning environments. And we can look at how can we bring forth some more positive qualities in that. So, that's a beneficial thing. And this is where we get into this idea of the acorn. Um, and the acorn is that team of people that works behind the scenes at an event to create a really connective, amazing experience for that group. And that's what I was feeling back when I was at that wilderness skills week. And there was that thing that I couldn't quite put my finger on as to why it was so amazing. And I saw there were volunteers. I saw there were teachers and role models there. What I didn't realize was that they were working behind the scenes. They had a plan. They were creating an intentional plan for how they would support that event. And because they did that and they all brought their best to it, they made this amazing experience to step into. And so, John, I was wondering, since you're here today, if you could tell us a little bit about you know, the origins of the acorn for a moment. his cell phone which it turns out he can't uh can't use the the microphone on <laughs> okay all right <laughs> well all right we'll see if we get john, uh, john back on here at any point but uh just for those who are curious about it um i know just from working with john for a number of years that this is a teamwork framework that developed over a number of years as john and ingwe and other uh different cultural experts work together to say, you know, how can we really, um, how can we build up a learning culture in our programs? Um, and maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that. Uh, he's, he's back now. All right. Oh, oh, looks like he left, he dropped again. <laughs> Something happened. Here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, we'll give that a try later, perhaps. <laughs> Oh, there, there, he you is. there you are. Yeah, the only thing I forgot to do was turn on my microphone. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, I thought when I got the Demio app, I'd be able to speak through my phone, but I was fooled. Um, so, yeah, my apologies, Josh, for that little awkward moment. And, um, yeah, you know, the origin of the acorn, um, yeah, um, uh, Carrie is asking, is it an acronym? It actually is not an acronym. I'm sure we could come up with one, but let's not do that right now. Um, the, the acorn concept comes from um, what the tree that generates acorn represents. So it's a symbol. And the symbol is, of course, that an acorn grows an oak tree. And if you're from other parts of the world where oak trees are not you know, part of the ecology, you may not 
be familiar with the symbolism of the oak, but the oak tree is a very slow growing tree that produces very high quality food for wildlife. Um, the flowers are amazing for insects and then that of course feeds the insects and the birds that feed on insects and um, the acorns themselves are incredible sources of protein and all of the wildlife that eats uh, anything like nuts just goes crazy for acorns. The trees are very strong and they and they live a very long time. The timbers of the oak, you know, the actual wood that comes out of it is very, very hard and dense and makes great building material, but it also, you know, they build ships from it in the old days. Um, and also uh, the shade of the oak tree is extraordinary um, in a hot summer's day to get under a big spreading oak tree and sit under the shade. So the oak represents, you know, nourishing the community. Um, and our elder, who's now an ancestor, Ingwe, was the one who came up with the name Acorn to describe the group approach to creating that, you know, that microculture that Josh was talking about. And the acorn itself uh, is symbolic of, you know, a person representing each of the attributes uh, of connection or the archetype that has to do with that time of day, that direction. Um, and it's an extraordinary little magical model, you know, Ingwe helped conceive of it and we worked with it from 1983 until 1995 together in New Jersey. Um, and it just kept getting better and better and more and more refined as more and more <clears throat> people got in there and played with it, you know, because it, it really is like play. You know, we don't have a manual that says this is how you have to be on the acorn. We say, you know, these are, this is the general intention or feeling uh, that you're holding in this direction, um, you know, you represent the East. So that's where the sun rises. So welcome people, you know, think of it as the beginning of the day and this is the beginning of their day with us. So welcome them like a sunrise and, you know, do it your way, whatever feels good to you. Um, so it's, it's a, a wonderful symbol. Um, and the acorn, of course, um, when, it, when it went down to Australia, the Art of Mentoring Australia crew and New Zealand crew, Barilla, hi, I know you're on here now decided that they didn't want to call it the acorn because uh, the oak is not native to California. So they, they called themselves the acacia crew. And so, you know, wherever you are on the planet, there is a slow growing tree that becomes, that's long lived, that feeds the people and gives shade and feeds the wildlife, you know, and that, uh, that was a totally appropriate thing for the, for the Australian New Zealand team to do. Uh, but yeah, the other thing that Ingwe would say is if you believe in the future, plant an oak tree uh, because you know you won't live long enough to nourish from its shades or, or climb in its branches or swing from a, a tree swing um, because it'll take a very long time for it to get big enough to do that so that means I believe in the future generations I love them I care about them I'm giving them something that I myself will not nourish from in that way um, but you know so it's a commitment also to the well-being of, of future generations so yeah, thanks for the opportunity to share that, Josh. And uh, next time, Matt, uh, text me a little bit ahead of when Josh is going to call on me <laughs> so I can get this microphone recorded. Hey, thanks, John. And I guess you probably can't see it right now, but we have up an image of that oak with the acorn there in the middle of it. Um, <laughs> so thanks for that story. I can see it. It's oh, beautiful. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> you know, so with that in mind, um, thinking about these microclimates of connection, our local little learning cultures that we can build, um, you know, within the ecology of a connected community, we would have mentors working individually with people. That's where transformative mentoring comes in. They would be looking for the individual's potential, just like the potential of that acorn to become the oak tree. And those mentors would one-on-one -on -one support those kinds of gifts to grow. Now the acorn would magnify that out and they're, the team working behind the scenes for the village, so to speak, or the village of your event, whatever the, uh, the moment is that you're enacting this. And they're looking on the community level to build up that potential and help that open up. So you have the mentor and then the ACORN team working on different levels to support this to happen. Um, and just like John was saying, uh, you know, there's different levels to this that creates that engagement. And one of those, just like with any kind of team framework, you have logistical things that have to happen, right? And 
you know, there might be a ton of tasks at your event or just throughout the day if you're running a camp or whatever your event is, you have things that have to get done, whether it's gathering firewood or dealing with registration tables, all that kind of stuff. So it makes sense that you want to be able to split up those logistics and have a team to handle that so that one person isn't stuck trying to do all that. And that's where many hands make light work. And for instance, you might have a greeter, right? Somebody who's greeting people as they come in, they arrive on site and you have that logistical side of it. But for me, what I found part of what makes the ACORN framework so special is that it's based on nature and we'll get more into this, but underneath that logistical role, there's a deeper layer. And if you pattern off of nature, you find that there's these different archetypes. And this is something we really get into in the Rebuilding Nature Connected Communities course, because we really take the time to experience each of these eight natural archetypes. And for instance, this is dealing with the East, which is the sunrise, and that's a very inspiring time. So we say that the archetype of that time of day is inspiration. So besides that logistical side of it, of, of helping to greet people, that East role would also involve holding a sort of vibe an archetype of nature, which is inspiration. And so it's almost like a theatrical aspect to it, um, but really in an authentic way of finding what's my connection to inspiration? How do I bring that through? So it involves each person's creativity. There's not a right way or a wrong way to do it, but it's just how do you find this and have this happen? And if you haven't checked this out, there's a great uh, interview with Rowena that I got to do the other day. Uh, that's up on our page for Rebuilding Nature Connected Communities. And she talks about her journey with that East archetype and finding her own authentic way to connect with that and the results of that. So if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend checking that out. But imagine that you have a team of people that are each holding a different vibe of nature, right? an archetype that's like a vibration, a feeling. And that is underpinning all of the logistical things that they're doing. So you have this interweaving of all this creativity happening. That's where the magic happens. It really brings in an amazing feeling to an event. And so what happens is you have this picture of a grid that's up now from the acorn. If you imagine all these little nodal points, these connections of all this interweaving of these different perspectives, these different vibrations of these archetypes, that there's this emergent culture of connection. It just comes up and out of all this creativity, really fun stuff starts to emerge. And it's different every time based on who's holding the roles and also that place where you are and the people that are there. There's this recipe of magic that happens. It's just this connective, really creative, amazing experience. And just to look at these archetypes really quickly, we won't go too deep into them now, but you can see things like inspiration and motivation, uh, integration, celebration, all these different things. Imagine just if that's what was creating the underpinnings of the culture for that week or for that day or however long your, your um, program is or your community event is, that if you had people intentionally holding space for each of these qualities to come through, what would happen? Well, that's basically what happens when you have an acorn supporting your event. And this is something that we really spend a lot of time with in the immersion program. Uh, we actually, throughout the year, one by one, go through these different archetypes and embody them through our own nature connection. And we found this is really important because we're working with this concept that change begins within. So the things that we want to see in our community and the world around us, if we can embody that in ourselves, we can naturally start to inspire that just through our own presence. And it helps us really understand how to start to build an ACORN team and bring these qualities out. So if we can find that in ourselves through our own nature connection, through our own creativity, it becomes that much easier and more authentic to bring that into our teamwork as well. So we spend a lot of time really through our own connection practices, getting out into nature and finding those archetypes inside of us through our nature connection. And you'll see in the picture here, now we've got it magnified, those little attributes of connection. This is 
sort of our litmus test. This is how we know that connection is present. And I was wondering, um, John, we'll give you a second to get your microphone queued up here, but um, be great if you have anything you want to share about the attributes, because uh, this is something that over the last few years, we've really put a lot of emphasis on and realizing this is a, a core piece to what we're doing with eight shields. And we'll see if, uh, if you're in a spot there where you can get the microphone going again. Uh, well, perhaps you'll jump in when you can, but. Yes. Okay. There you are. So the attributes of connection. Um, you know, I was I have the pleasure of sitting with Ashur Charneau, who's also listening live to this webinar. Um, she's here in SoCal with us for a couple of weeks and uh, supporting us as we're moving. Um, and she was talking to me about a uh, presentation she gave at a at a library up up in the Ontario region, and she was. She made a handout where on one side of the handout were these core routines of nature connection and on the other side were the attributes of connection. Um, and she basically said, it's simple. If you stick to these core routines, you know, for a year or two in a routine way, then you will have these attributes, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's pretty much that simple. Um, you know, our, our friend Kathleen Lockyer is an occupational therapist and she uh, makes a very important point, um, maybe the most important sentence of my entire career I heard from Kathleen, and it comes out of occupational therapy and neurobiology, and it essentially says that emotional regulation sits on the foundation of sensory integration. And, and those are all very big words, uh, but it essentially is saying that we are happy and healthy, you know, we are vital, we are empathetic, we're helpful, we're alive, we have the quiet mind, we have an open, caring heart, um, we listen well to each other. We have that emotional regulation when our senses are integrated in the way that the neurobiology of our body is, is essentially set up to do. Like if, if we meet our nervous system where it's at and use it for what its purpose is for, which is connecting to nature, to other people, to ourselves. If, if we use it for what it's intended, we exercise it and we awaken it and it grows into this greater uh, system of interconnection, which allows for energy to flow in, in, the, in the healthy and natural and, and, and original way that, that this, this being, this human being is set up to optimize through. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, what Josh is, is referencing right now, you know, this is the mission and vision of Eight Shields to get every person on the planet to these attributes uh, and then to surround them with a culture that supports those attributes in that individual and then passes it forward seven generations to come because, you know, that's a big mission and, and, and we're not, you know, we're, as Josh said, you know, change starts with us, right? When we habilitate our sensory system and reawaken our connection capabilities and our our our, capa our, our uh, connection potential we end up with these attributes because in a sense these attributes are a direct reflection they are another way to describe emotional regulation which is health and happiness um, you know and the the other thing that I I think that you know should be mentioned is that you know we all understand educational and vocational training and we use metrics and processes that support educational vocational training. Um, but we wouldn't use health and fitness metrics and processes to get an educational outcome. In the same way, the connection system of the human being is, is different than how the vocational training system works with us or how health and fitness works with us. They're interrelated, they're overlapping, they're complementary, but we literally need to take a different approach to get the results of connection. So we say, we, we talk about connection modeling and the ACORN uh, leadership model is at the core of connection modeling. Like it's, it's a way to ensure that the circuitry is there to awaken the senses and to awaken the attributes of connection. So uh, maybe that was more than you bargained for Josh, but <laughs> thanks for 
giving me a chance to speak to that. <laughs> That's great. That's perfect, John. Thank you. And that really is the core, whether we're doing nature connection, mentoring work, bird language, anything that we're doing really uh, in the eight shields framework ties back to this core of these attributes of connection. And in the immersion program, we actually spend a couple of weeks at least on each of those attributes. And throughout the nine months, we work through practices that really bring us deeply into each of those. And that's one of our outcomes that we're looking for. And so we see that when we have that interdependent cycle functioning, when nature is supporting culture and culture is supporting nature through mentoring, through connection, that we get these predictable results. We get these attributes of connection emerging over and over. So if we were to look at our event or whatever it is that we're uh, implementing our acorn around, this would be something we're tracking throughout the day, throughout the week, or however long the event is and beyond, you know, what attributes are emerging? What can we do to facilitate this to happen within the framework of our gathering? And just to chart the impact of this for a moment, we have some data that was collected by our friend Mark Mori and his organization, We Are Nature Rising Earth. It's a very cool website uh, that's worth checking out. And they actually spent some time interviewing different alumni um, of events that have had this ACORN model as part of it. And he's identified that uh, there's over just in North America, I don't think they were able to do any international uh, research on this yet. Uh, but at least within North America, there's over 73 uh, nature connection organizations that have been inspired by this model with 500,000 plus alumni. And this group is collectively serving over 50,000 people annually. So just for a moment, feel into that. All these little pulses of microclimates of connective learning environments that are out there connecting with the cycles of the earth through mentoring and through this team approach, it's very cool. And I know that there's also, um, you know, on a number of other uh, places around the world in different continents, this is also reaching out. So it's just cool to see, you know, since those days uh, that John was describing, working on this model with Ingwe, and now, you know, since the early 80s, now seeing this spread out to help so many youth and adults around the world. It's very cool. And yes, there's definitely some gaps on this map. So. Uh, if any of you out there listening are working with this, I would definitely recommend going to wearenaturerising.earth and adding your location in there. Um, you know, so that's the question. Would you like to bring this to your community as well? You know, there's a lot of potential there um, on any scale. We've had people um, come into this training just because they want to do something for themselves to really bring those attributes into their own life. And we've had it go all the way to people who are starting schools, you know, starting actual um, schools with different grade levels and things like that that wanted to bring this in. So there's a lot of room for potential on just about every scale you can imagine. So let's talk now that we've gone through some of the philosophical underpinnings of this that really are driving uh, what we're doing here. Let's look at the actual program for those of you who thinking about getting into this, what it entails. And just on that outcomes level, again, really it's initially about deepening your own nature connection journey, connecting with those eight natural archetypes and with those attributes of connection that we talked about, really waking that up, uh, bringing those fully into your life. And then during that journey, experiencing a mentoring community, being on these phone calls, you get to you know, connecting with the stories from people around the world who are also doing this and all asking questions together, both on the group calls and on our online forum. And it really is about stepping into this new level of connective potential. And we actually dedicate a whole part of the winter block to a process called renew of, renewal of creative path. And it really dives into your creative connective journey. So there's that individual level. And then there's also the availability with this to really springboard this in your community as you learn. So as we go through the year, what we do is we start to implement little practices step by step that you can bring into your community on any scale that you feel ready to do. 
And there's group facilitation tools, processes we use in circles and in different levels of the group work. And there's also the chance to create seasonal nature gatherings throughout the year. And so we actually guide you through four of those through the different seasons and give you tools that can help you bring people together to connect with nature and then implement the acorn as you do that step by step. So you know, this is things like potlucks, or you might apply this to an event or workshop or some other kind of community setting that you have going where you can recruit a few friends or people that you're working with and actually put these tools into use step by step. So by the end of the year, you've had four opportunities to actually implement this in a guided way. So that's what we're getting at here with this. And we have uh, a number of calls throughout the year where we get together and we move through um, some different materials, and move through these practices together. Uh, we have some amazing staff that have been working together for several years on this um, that are helping this to happen, including Amy Hyatt, who's helped launch and really get acorns going in a strong way in many places, um, especially based in the Northeast. Amy's an amazing resource and she does our one-on-one -on -one calls as well as part of this program, helping people really troubleshoot or just vision for where they're at with this process and implementing this stuff. Um, you also get to experience peer-to-peer -peer learning because on every call we have moderated small group discussions where we get into the material of that section of the course. And every call also features a live mentoring demonstration. So usually we'll have one or two people that out of those small groups will pick and we'll come together and actually get to demonstrate transformative mentoring live so everybody can benefit from that person's learning journey. That's an amazing feature because by the end of the year, you've experienced so many people uh, being on that live mentoring seat right there that you get to really feel how mentoring works. And it also helps because their learning becomes your learning and, and vice versa. It's really amazing. Um, so on each call, we also have a keynote from John and from myself that guide you through the archetypes, guide you through the attributes of connection and give you practices you can try for that week or so. And it really brings in a lot of inspiration. It helps you bring these practices to life so you can apply them for yourself and your community. We also have some videos that really detail how to get the acorn going. Um, so there's a lot of different resources um, we'll get more into that, but just the calls themselves uh, are held on Thursdays beginning at September and they go for nine months and there's two call times you can choose from an 11 a.m. Pacific or a 5.30 p.m. Pacific and it has 16 calls total over nine months. So about every two weeks or so we have a call and they're each an hour and a half long and you get recordings of them. Uh, and it's really just amazing because we really have the spaciousness that way to go deep into these topics. And that's why we've designed it this way. Oh, I'm sorry. I see Matt's telling me it's actually 5 p.m. I needed to update my slide there. So it's 11 a.m. or 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, we've also included for members of the training program access to our village talk calls. And these are not required, but they're highly recommended and you get them as part of the package because we'd love to build that layer of connection really strong. And these are weekly calls every Tuesday. And it's a great opportunity to connect with a community of practice with peers from around the world who are implementing this kind of stuff for discussion around all things to do with connection. And there's three times, and maybe John, you can speak to that a little bit um, when you get your mic up and running. Um, just a little bit about, you know, village talk and what that is. But there's three call times, 11, 4, or 7 p.m. Pacific. And you also get a recording of that. So even if you can't be on there live, you'll still be able to get those recordings. And it's just an amazing, amazing way to connect with so many people around the world on a regular basis, share stories, and get even more practices that you can use uh, related to this whole connection journey. Um, so, John, whenever you're on, um, just let me know. I'll keep going until I hear from you. <laughs> I'm ready this time. All right. Hey there. <laughs> hey. Um, yeah, Village Talk. Um, oh, I guess uh, Matt would know. He'll probably type it in the chat for us there. But I think it's been going for about seven, going on eight years now. 
um, 7.5 years. <laughs> and uh, it was something that Josh Lane, uh, that's Josh talking to you now, and myself, John Young, we created um, at the behest of a consultant who basically said, if I go on the Eight Shields website, you guys talk all about mentoring. And then I try to sign up for a program that actually teaches me mentoring by mentoring me. And I can't find it. <laughs> Where is it? And we're like, oh, <laughs> good point. So Josh and I formed a focus group with a number of uh, wonderful men and women around the world and um, uh, talked about, you know, what what are the core elements that we need to hold space for in order to create a mentoring experience that uses mentoring to model mentoring to then teach mentoring. And we invented uh, what is now called Village Talk, and it's been running every Tuesday, and, um, and Matt's been on it since almost the beginning. Um, and a lot of us who are supporting uh, Art of Mentoring Leadership are also staff on Village Talk. And um, I, I try to make every single Tuesday, and, and, and we have three call times, uh, 11 a.m., 4 p.m., and 7 p.m., I try to be on all three calls when it's possible. I'm always on the 11 o'clock call unless I'm traveling and then I pre-record a keynote. But we have such amazing mentors now who have many, 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 many years of experience, uh, both through Village Talk and in their communities as mentors who are holding space, elders and wonderful elder men and women and fantastic tech people and a great forum. And um, it's true what Josh <clears throat> said earlier, you know, if if you're in art of mentoring leadership and you can make it to Village Talk, take full advantage of it because it's a fantastic learning opportunity and it just deepens and deepens what's happening in the art of mentoring leadership program. But I, I personally love Village Talk. It's become like my, my virtual village. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I just have so many wonderful relationships um, around the world through Village Talk. So. Yeah, do take advantage if, if you can. I mean, it's a lot, I know, to have calls on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but if you got the time and you can drop in, please do. Thank you. For those of you who are wondering, John was uh, referencing Art of Mentoring Leadership, and that is the program that is now Rebuilding Nature Connected Communities. We, we ran with that title for several years, and uh, we decided to, to go with this new name. Um, just because we realized that uh, so many of the folks coming in, you know, not only wanted to do this for bringing a, this artimentary model into their communities, but they just wanted to get their feet wet with the Eight Shields model and, you know, bring this into their own life as well. So we decided that uh, Rebuilding Nature Connected Communities would be a bit more of an inclusive name for what we we're doing. Um, so that's what John was referencing there, uh, was the, the original name of this program, just so you guys know. Um, and that Village Talk program, it really is quite amazing to see people who've been in there for a long time, how they've absorbed that mentoring capacity. And we often have people come back as helpers as well um, as they move through that down the road. So just know that, um, you know, that option is there too. And that's something we love to see is people who keep coming back and then start to help out so they can put these skills uh, into a deeper practice. Uh, beyond, you know, the training calls we've talked about, we also have include three personal mentoring calls spread throughout the training. And this is really crucial, we found, because everybody's journey is so unique and different with this process. As you integrate the information, as you embody the practices, and just depending on what's going on, like if you're working more on your own or if you're working on a community level, uh, there's different ways you'll want to put this information into practice. So the one-on-one -on -one calls are really meant to give you personalized guidance to do that in the best way and then to troubleshoot too and just help you, you know, refine what you're doing as you move forward. Um, and we're really lucky to have Amy Hyatt providing these calls because Amy's been involved with the Art of Mentoring, uh, which is one of our events that utilizes the ACORN uh, behind the scenes. And she's really helped so many people over the years to uh, get trained in the ACORN model and to put that on the ground in their community, that she's just a wealth of information and insight uh, that really can help you to get this going. So it's just an amazing chance to work with Amy as you go through the training on that. Um, along the way too, as we get into the winter, as I mentioned before, we work with the renewal of Creative Path. And this is a 
toolkit that John has put together again over many years of working, helping people um, not only kind of reboot their own connective system, but work with the things that come up as that happens with the blocks that sometimes come up just from our different past experiences and to really get that connection flowing um, in our lives. And that's an amazing resource just in itself to work through that. Um, but it really helps jumpstart when you're looking at how to put connection and build those roots into your community, um, the things that will come up along the way. And this helps you really work through that and then build a vision for where you want to go with it. Um, so just on its own, that's amazing. As well, throughout the course, we have the Acorn Leaders Toolkit. Um, and this is something where John has condensed all that knowledge and wisdom um, that's emerged from these years of working with this framework and put it all into one audio training. And so there's so much there. And what we do is we spread it throughout the course, throughout the nine months. And together we work on that stage by stage so that you can learn every aspect of the ACORN model, how to implement it, what the roles are, what the archetypes are, all these different things. And there's also some great stories in there. And, you know, we really help you to integrate this piece by piece. And that's our goal uh, is not to overwhelm you with stuff, but to give you things you can do bit by bit put them into action. So if you're feeling like this is something you're interested in uh, and you have more questions, we'll, we'll field a few questions here uh, before we wrap. But if you definitely are feeling called to this, you can book a discovery session by emailing Garrett at eightshields.org. And Garrett helps out um, with so many things at Eight Shields behind the scenes. And he's always happy to talk with you, field your questions, and just get a sense of what program's right for you as you look at your training moving forward. So definitely drop Garrett an email if that's something you're interested in. And you can learn more about the program and all the dates for the calls, all the different things involved with it on our site. Uh, if you go to the mentoring tab, you'll see Rebuilding Nature Connected Communities there. Um, so do check that out. Um, and I've got a link up here as well you can see. Uh, but yeah, just go to the site and you'll find that off the mentoring tab pretty easily. Um, so that's, you know, the information on the program here. Um, and just for those who are on here, well, first, John, any, any other thoughts you want to share before we take a question or two? Um, and for those who are on here, just think if you have any questions you'd like to share uh, through the chat about the program, we'd love to, to try to field a couple of those before the hour is up here as well. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, I'm here to also support in the answering of questions. Um, I did want to also mention that uh, Barilla just offered a nice chat. She's been one of the people who's helped facilitate, um, you know, the Rebuilding Nature Connected Communities course on, when we were calling it Art of Mentoring Leadership. Um, and she's an amazing elder and a wonderful presence in Village Talk and uh, likely a lot of the other group calls that are coming up. So um, it's not only Josh and myself and Amy helping to run this course, but Matt is helping and people like Barilla and Rowena and Ruth Corey helps with uh, responder stuff on different parts of things uh, for H Shields. So there's an amazing community of helpers and mentors. So um, please, uh, you know, consider this if it, if it feels, oh yeah, <laughs> Barilla's saying it's fun. Yes, I agree. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess we'll take, take it over to the questions. And thanks for that wonderful slideshow, Josh. Thanks, John. Let's see, John, maybe you could field this question. Lily has a question coming in. Is this related or connected with or aligned with NVC or permaculture? Great question. You know, there's overlaps with both NVC and permaculture. Um, art of, uh, the art of mentoring and... Uh, you know, connection modeling is based on a deliberate and careful communication style, you know, to create connection, people need to feel safe and how we use our words is important and also what energy we're coming from when we speak, you know, so um, there's a big overlap with NVC techniques and over the years we've had a lot of NVC practitioners working with H Shields and, and vice versa and we find a lot of complimentary stuff going on there. Um, and we feel in alignment and, and in strong collaboration with uh, NBC. Um, as far as permaculture is concerned, you know, um, the Eight Shields map integrates permaculture principles. And 
that wasn't too hard to do. When we started the very first project in 1983, we also started an organic farm and a natural foods restaurant that incorporated permaculture. So we were aware that the permaculture principles were very much in alignment with the wisdom principles. And I came to find out later by becoming a, a member of the permaculture teaching team at the um, Regenerative Design Institute that you know both permaculture and H Shields are sourcing from earth-based wisdom. So there's a big overlap there as well. And we work very cooperatively with the international permaculture movement. And we have a lot of projects that uh, employ both permaculture and the H Shields model. Um, and that's uh, especially strong in Europe. And it's there's a couple of sites in the US where that's catching on. Along with that too, I'm thinking about you know Penny Livingston at RDI, what she always used to say was, you know, the first principle of observation and permaculture um, and how she would see people go through this nature connection process at their sit spot, um, you know, just emerging as really powerful observers of the land and having really strong connections just through getting out there and activating all their senses regularly. Um, so just, you know, in a way we do that uh, through this course, getting a lot of sit spot time in, different times of day and night and really watching what happens and feeling it in our bodies on the land. So that definitely goes hand in hand uh, with that permaculture approach. And since we have Ruth Corey on here too, I saw Ruth put in on the chat and I um, just really want to echo what she's saying because Ruth is our course responder and uh, she just really makes a space, such a nice space for folks who are going through our different online trainings um, as they're sending in their reflections on the different modules um, through email to Ruth and Ruth gets back to folks and just really holds that space um, to catch those stories and reflections. So that's also part of the, the course as you go through the toolkits, the uh, renewal of creative path and the acorn toolkit that, you know, Ruth will be there catching your stories and um, yeah, just grateful that Ruth's, uh, you know, with us in that capacity and bringing all her gifts um, with that. So know that that's part of it too. And that's really helpful to know somebody's there catching your stories each step of the way on different levels. Um, so thank you, Ruth. And let's see, we had a question from Sarah here. Um, let's see, is this good for those wanting to develop a nature connection program to share with people, but don't know where to start? Also, would it be too much to do with Kamana 3 and or Shikari 2? <laughs> hey, Sarah, glad you're on here with us. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot to that question. Um, this will give you a good framework uh, in terms of, you know, different simple things you can start to implement in terms of uh, potluck gatherings or um, little moments that help you connect with nature in your neighborhood and gathering people around that. Um, and those things can translate pretty much on any level, um, whether any kind of program you're running, you can bring that model into it. Um, so in that way, it does support it. I'd say, you know, if you're starting a whole nature program, that's, that's a pretty large scope um, to it. And this would be supportive of that. Um, it could be done alongside Kamana um, because the sit spot practices can overlap. Um, it just depends on how much time you have. I think uh, for your situation, that might work because I, I know you. Um, for some folks, that might be a little too much to do, but I think you could probably you could probably handle that. Um, John, any thoughts on, yeah, just folks who want to develop a nature connection program, they don't know where to start and how this will support that? Um, you know, I think it's all about pacing. You know, I... I, I I would hate to think um, that at any point, you know, take, doing too much at the same time would make this feel like a strain or work. You know, um, remember that when we're doing connection um, activities in our lives, we're feeling safe, we're feeling relaxed, we're feeling open. So I would tell, I would guide people, uh, as I always have, to really, you know, trust your gut feeling on that and to pace yourself and not to put too much of an expectation on yourself in terms of like having to finish, uh, for instance, Kamana by a certain time, you know, allow it to be organic, allow it to flow. 
um, and integrate it into your everyday life in a relaxed way. And the same is true with Shikari, um, which is a more of a tracking program. But we, you know, I, I don't see that there would be a conflict to have uh, Art of Mentoring Leadership and Kamana going at the same time. I think it would be a wonderful overlap and, and there would be ways to stack functions and be co accomplishing goals for both programs at the same time because both are working with sit spot and both are working with various sensory awakening techniques and nature connection stuff. So especially with Kamana, I see it as highly complementary and uh, not, you know, not, not pulling you in two directions, but the most important thing is that you're enjoying the journey for both of them. Great. Thank you, John. Yeah. Taking the, the slow and steady approach to all this stuff uh, really creates space for things to percolate. Um, but I could see, you know, with uh, we work through these different events throughout the year in this program, um, and I could see some interesting space for connections with tracking around that, um, gathering people around tracks. That would be a very interesting direction to head. Um, let's see, any other questions coming in? Thank you, everybody. Looks like we're we're at time here. I'm not seeing any last questions. Matt, any uh, any additions here before we wrap? No, I don't think so. I just uh, well, I guess I said no, and then I'm going to say something. So yes, just <laughs> briefly. Um, yeah, I I'll just I'll just uh, double down on on the village talk recommendation uh, to go along the way. It seems that the people. Who have who have gotten the most out of the the prime program are those who have also been able to show up for village talk and and how much of that is just a general level of of commitment and and willingness to to show up and how much of that is is the direct uh, impact of village talk it's it's hard to say but but there's definitely uh, in my experience a, a underappreciated power in showing up. Uh, you know, the, the commitment to showing up uh, over time, you know, any given village talk call, any given art of mentoring call, sometimes there's something that's sort of profound that, that comes out of those. But the, uh, my experience is that mostly it's just little nudges, but the cumulative effect of those little nudges over time, the, the continual engagement of these kinds of conversations in these kinds of connective uh, settings, uh, helps you come to embody the um, the experience and the understanding in ways that allows you to then bring it to to others that you're working with which is just the a large part of the intention of this course is to or this program is to help people uh, achieve that so I'll just uh, yeah give a give a two thumbs up for for village talk as part of the as part of the process and of course all the great work that uh, is in the art of mentoring, or the uh, excuse me, the re rebuilding nature connected communities um, uh, core core materials as well. Great, thank you, Matt. Yeah, um, and just one last, uh, we had one last question come in real quick from Glenn. Um, Glenn says, "Found myself becoming disabled three years ago. Uh, any ideas about participating in village talk when I have a difficult time talking?" Um, and we do use a note system in there when we're in small groups where we can, uh, through Google Documents, actually share our stories. Uh, we usually take notes for each other in there. So that there might be some creative ways, um, you know, we could we could get into that. So I'd recommend emailing support at eightshields.org. Um, and perhaps uh, Matt can, can guide you in some ideas on how that might work for you, Glenn. And so, yeah, I just want to thank everybody uh, who's tuned in today. Thank you, John. Thank you, Matt and Ruth and everybody, Barilla and everybody behind the scenes at all these programs and everyone who's uh, who signed in today or who's listening to this. Thanks again. And um, yeah, we wish you all the best in your connection uh, that you're creating in your life and in your neighborhood. And yeah, John, any last words as we wrap here today? I'm, I'm going to echo what everyone's saying in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, together we'll we'll do something truly beautiful in this world and let's let's keep it going. Woohoo. Yeah, right on. <laughs> All right, well we'll sign out here today. Thanks everybody. Please do email if you have questions or to set up a discovery session with Garrett and enjoy the rest of your days or nights wherever you are. Until next time.
Take care.